now for Kathy Campbell, who we're really delighted to welcome back to the Institute. She's been here a few times before. She told me she did some research uh, in our archives, for one of her books as well. Because um, one of the things that's happening tonight is uh, um, she's presenting and launching her latest publication, hold it up for the camera, um, entitled Cultivating the Renaissance. It's her 10th book. Uh, there's copies here for, on sale for afterwards at the discounted price of 25 euros, bit pricey because it's one of those academic publishers who charge an arm and a leg for great research and writing. Um, anyhow, this it, it informs, I think, tonight's talk. Uh, yeah, Cathy has a distinguished and long career as an um, academic in UK. Uh, most recently, it was uh, the pro professor running the MA course on landscape gardening at the University of Bristol. Um, so I, I think that's all I will say about Cathy now. Let her give her lecture. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Good. Well, it's nice to see so many of you here on um, this dreary spring evening. Um, Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Medici uh, Tuscan villas. And this is Cafagiolo, which is the earliest of the villas. Um, it's the first of the villas. Its acquisition marked the beginning of the family's ascent from anonymous citizens to being one of the leading dynasties in Europe. A former Republican fortress, it sits in the shadow of a dark forest 20 miles northeast of Florence. Although it's isolated and austere, uh, the family retained a sort of sentimental affection for the villa through the generations because it had been a favorite of both Cosimo the Elder and Lorenzo the Magnificent, who were um, the two most illustrious members of the family. Well, one evening in um, July 1576, Pietro de' Medici, who was the youngest and most dissolute of the late Grand Duke Cosimo's uh, sons, um, summoned his young wife Leonora to a hunting party at the villa. There she is. Um, she'd been raised in the Medici household to train her for a life at court. Uh, in fact, Cosmo's wife, Eleanor of Toledo, was her aunt. Um, her natural vivacity had enchanted the, great, uh, the late Grand Duke, but nonetheless, to consolidate his alliance with Spain, uh, he'd condemned her to marry his son, with whom she'd been raised as a sibling. Well, the son was not best pleased, and he proceeded to humiliate his wife with string mistresses. Um, so she, in turn, consoled herself with a lover. Um, there he is. You can see he doesn't look like a particularly nice person. Um, witnesses record that on the night in question, Leonora danced until dawn and then retired to her chamber where her husband proceeded to strangle her to death with a dog leash. Uh, the Grand Duke Francesco announced that Leonora had died of a heart attack, but gossip moved quickly. And soon the whole of, uh, whole of Europe knew that she'd been murdered by her husband. Well, Cafagiolo also uh, was implicated in another family tragedy that year. If the Medici sent their young man to Cafagiolo uh, and other distant villas to keep them out of trouble, they also sent their young women to these distant villas when they were already in trouble. Earlier that summer, Francesco's um, sister, Isabella, who we'll return to later, had discreetly retired to Cafagiolo with only a small entourage, um, prompting the ambassador from Ferrara to suggest she'd gone to swell her belly. The fact that two months later, her husband murdered her at another distant villa uh, adds credence to the speculation that she'd probably retreated there to give birth to her lover's child. Well, these auxoricides marked a turning point in the Medici fortunes. Francesco's tolerance of the, of the killings provoked unease among his, uh, his uh, people, especially as a locust plague soon befell the region, causing a widespread famine. There's an irony to the fact that the villa which first marked the Medici's rise to prominence was also linked to their downfall. Well, the Medici Tuscan villas can be divided into three major styles. From 1350 to about 1450, you have the early Renaissance or humanist villas. These were basically defensive towers or old farmhouses, which were renovated to make them more comfortable for their urban owners. These early villas demonstrate a new interest in nature, the enclosed inward looking dwellings of the Middle Ages were opened up to embrace the surrounding landscape. Um, combining utility with pleasure, these villas were places of spiritual contemplation as well as rural industry. So here we see um, it was probably an old farmhouse and this medieval village was kind of turned into outbuildings. Um, but you have windows penetrating the walls to sort of bring in nature. 
Well, from 1450 to 1550, you have the High Renaissance. Um, the villas evolved from being um, a sort of spiritual retreat to a kind of worldly palace. Looking to the classical past, patrons developed new architectural models based on balance and proportion. Um, instead of the haphazard renovations and, uh, and extensions of the earlier period, these villas were rationally designed to, with the house and the garden, um, both conceived as a single harmonious whole. And again, you can see that the villa is uh, symmetrical, it sits in the middle of the estate, and the gardens are placed in a sort of in a, um, symmetrical pattern around the villa. Well, having reached the limits of rationality and order in the late Renaissance or Baroque period from about 1550 to about 1650, designers turned back to nature for inspiration, um, creating dramatic places of sensuality and enchantment. Here at La Peggio, we can see not one but two different ball games being played in the forecourt. Uh, there's a hunt going on in the foreground. Um, we have an urban uh, carriage coming along to bring new visitors. Um, this grand stable would have uh, supported the hunting horses and the carriage horses and the, the donkeys for the women to ride. And this large walled garden suggests that they needed a lot of food to keep the um, hunting parties uh, uh, full of food. Well, Caffè Giolo falls into the first of these categories. It was an early humanist villa. It appears to have come into the Medici hands soon after the founding of the Republic in 1115. As the city's wealth increased, enterprising individuals had begun looking for business opportunities beyond the city walls in such rural enterprises as stone quarries, brick kilns, potteries, forestry, fisheries, and particularly large scale agriculture to feed the expanding population. Um, this was a time of great social change with the land ownership moving from the nobility to the bourgeoisie. And it altered the appearance of the countryside as acres of wilderness were tamed and brought under cultivation. Gottsley's uh, 1459 procession of the Magi shows a neat patchwork of farms and woodland, meadows and orchards. So we see farms, woodland, meadows, orchards, um, all stitched together by roads, um, which uh, link the countryside to the urban centers. As a well-managed farm could provide its owners with wine and oil, fruit and vegetables, cereal, meat and fish, farms offered the promise of self-sufficiency, um, which was particularly appearing, appealing in a time when famines were still frequent and urban households included extended families, employees, servants, and slaves, all of whom had to be fed. But these rural properties were used for pleasure as well as utility in the form of the villagiatura or rural vacation, much celebrated by the writers of antiquity. Since the 11th century, crusaders returning from the Holy Lands, and then we have later merchants and scholars, were importing ancient manuscripts, sparking an interest in classical philosophy and science. And this new focus on human achievement, which was dubbed humanism, dubbed humanism, shifted attention from God to man, from the spiritual to the secular, from faith to reason, uh, from superstition to science. It also incidentally marked the beginning of the decline in the power of the church. And one of the key features of humanism was a love of nature, uh, which was no longer seen as a malevolent force that had to be guarded against. Nature became, as it had been in the ancient world, something to celebrate and rural life became the ideal, providing otium, which was a sort of contemplation and spiritual peace and leisure, as opposed to negotium, which was the competitive, corrupt frenzy of the city. So you have affluent businessmen beginning to acquire the crumbling towers of the increasingly impoverished aristocrats and transforming them into humanist villas from which to oversee their commercial enterprises while also communing with nature and studying the classics. Some later historians, such as um, Harold Acton, suggested that the Medici deliberately fostered this humanist fashion for rural life to lure the powerful families out of the city so they could rule Florence unchallenged. That may or may not be true. Um, in any case, the earliest reference to Cafagiolo was a will from the early 14th century, which describes the estate as a large house with an orchard. Several generations later on his death in 1363, one Averardo de' Medici left Cafagiolo to his sons two of whom ran the farm, while the third, Giovanni, went on to found the Medici uh, banking dynasty. Despite his humble origins, Giovanni's prospects were sufficient in those meritocratic times uh, to secure him an advantageous marriage and enable him to purchase the estate from his two brothers. But despite his flourishing career, 
Giovanni lived a quiet life and did little to embellish Cafagiolo. That was down to his son, his eldest son, Cosimo, who was a brilliant banker and a canny politician who really rose to become the de facto ruler of the city, as I'm sure you all know. And we see here in Pontormo's um, posthumous portrait, um, uh, the portrait itself is a sort of declaration of intent, of dynastic intent. The motto on the scroll uh, reads, as one is torn away, another appears. And the laurel in the background is a reference to Lorenzo, uh, who was his heir, his grandson. And although Cosimo here is wearing the robes of a scholar, his gnarled hands suggest a farmer, but they also perhaps suggest the arthritis and gout which afflicted the family for many generations. But it was Cosimo who instructed the family architect, Michelozzo, to transform the ancient fortress into a comfortable residence that we see here. Um, although the villa appears impenetrable, in fact, the front facade is simply a curtain wall enclosing the courtyard behind. You can see the courtyard behind. And the crenellations were ornamental rather than practical. In fact, these faux medieval features might well have been added by the Medici to suggest an ancient heritage for their family whose origins were at best obscure. In fact, as the word cafagiolo is actually a Lombard word, meaning an enclosure of trees, uh, the Medici's enemies suggested that the family were uh, in fact defended, descended not from farmers as they claimed, but from coal burners, charcoal burners. Um, charcoal burning being a very lowly and despised trade. But while the moat and the drawbridge, uh, moat and drawbridge, uh, were retained, the walls of the building were pierced with windows and the battlements were roofed uh, to convert the former patrol posts into elegant promenades from which to view the surrounding landscape. Michelotto also ensured that the uh, interiors were comfortable enough to satisfy important guests. In the mid 15th century, Pope Pius stayed in Cafagiolo several times while on diplomatic uh, missions to the north. Although the villa was conveniently located on the main route north, the Pope's visit attests both to the growing importance of the Medici villa and indeed to the luxury uh, of the Medici family and indeed to the luxury of their villa. In his commentaries, the Pope um, described the villa as Cosmo's magnificent place. And while patrons would keep their most prized possessions in their urban palaces, the fact that the Medici kept um, Baldo Venetti's grand Madonna and child in the chapel at Capacciolo is a testament to their increasing wealth. Here we see the Madonna seated on a, a grand um, Anatolian carpet, advertising the Medici's trading links with the Levant. And to her left, next to uh, John the Baptist, we have um, uh, the Christian martyrs, the early Christian martyrs, Saints Cosmos and uh, Damien, who were pious doctors um, chosen as patron saints to promote the idea that the Medici were in fact uh, descended from medical men. And on the Virgin's right, um, we have uh, Cosimo's grandson's namesakes, um, Saints Julian and Lawrence, or Lorenzo, whose um, signature grill is, um, is uh, embroidered into his robe. Well, in the fashion of the time, Cosimo sent his grandsons to spend long summers at the villa. With its dense woodlands and its river nearby, it offered a refreshing retreat from the fetid heat of the Florentine summer. In April, 1467, the agent writes, yesterday we went fishing and the boys caught enough for the dinner. Tomorrow we will begin to show them the, the estate as you ordered. So this indicates that as well as providing a refuge from the annual plagues and as well from the temptations of the city, these rural villas were um, used to introduce the next generation to the business of farming. They also provided a peaceful place for study. Another letter from Cafagiolo notes, Lorenzo is well and we are getting on with Ovid, uh, which indicates that the boys were receiving a classical education. Well, after Lorenzo's marriage, which was, it must be said, a diplomatic union rather than a love match, he would dispatch his wife and children to the villa. And despite his affection for the place, he rarely visited when they were in residence. Uh, deprived of his company, the children's tutor, who was his friend, the philosopher Poliziano, found country life rather dull. In uh, 1478, after the Republican Patsies had attempted to assassinate Lorenzo and succeeded in assassinating his brother, Lorenzo sent the family to the safety of Cafagiolo. Far from the intrigue and excitement, with only Lorenzo's illiterate, illiterate wife for company, Poliziano complained, the rain is so heavy and so continuous that we cannot leave the house. I remain by the fire in slippers and greatcoat. Were you to see me, you would think I was melancholy personified. When at Florence, at least we have the satisfaction of seeing Lorenzo. So that gives you a rather different view of 
uh, villa life. But um, on the long wall of the stable in Zocchi's 18th century print, we see one of Lorenzo's um, most prized possessions. It was a six and a half foot unicorn horn. Um, unicorn horn was highly valued at the time. In fact, it had been since the Middle Ages uh, because it was thought to purify water, to detect poison, to enhance potency, to ease pregnancy, to deter epilepsy, and to cure almost every known disease, including snake bites, fevers, and plague. Well, in fact, it, uh, it was a narwhal tusk. Um, and over the years, it made its way to Fagiolu, where um, it, or perhaps some facsimile of it, was still hanging there uh, when I visited it about 10 years ago. I don't know if it's still there, but... Um, but it might well be. Well, in the tumult following Lorenzo's death in 1492 and the family's exile two years later, Cafagiolo was ne neglected for nearly a century until the Grand Duke Fernando, Ferdinando incorporated it into his annual pilgrimage around the duchy. In October, 1605, the court doctor reports, after a morning hunt with the local gentry, the Grand Duke invited all the young ladies around and gave a dance on the lawn. Not surprisingly, His Highness enjoyed himself thoroughly. Which brings us back to Justin Newton's and these images of the Medici villas. Um, these were created in the reign of Ferdinando. Um, he commissioned 17 of them, each of which was to go above a door or a window in the grand salon of his hunting villa of um, Armino. Um, they provide an extraordinary catalog of Medici wealth and power. Uh, with hunting villas and fishing lodges and farms and pleasure grounds. And they're also, um, they're almost forensic in their detail. Uh, they offer a virtual inventory of every single property, uh, depicting barns and outbuildings, um, orchards, fields, woods, streams, as well as the villas and the gardens. So this 16th century portrait of Cavacciolo shows a typical Baroque garden with a central axis uh, linking the, the road, um, linking the villa to the road, and then a sort of axis going through the villa and through the garden to a grotto at the very back. And we see the garden is symmetrical. It's divided into these parterres. Um, the astute among you will notice there are no flowers in the parterres, but that is appropriate for a hunting villa. And this um, strange sort of pavilion-like topiary tree uh, is a very Baroque feature because um, in that period, they love the idea of man working with nature to create uh, a work of art. Well, there it is today. With Fernando's death in 1609, Villa was too rustic for the princely tastes of later Grand Dukes, uh, and it was largely ignored. In the 1860s, with Italian unification, it was purchased by an Italian prince, Prince Borghese, who demolished the rear tower, uh, removed the outer wall, cut uh, a grand uh, arch into the curtain wall, uh, filled in the moat, and generally transformed the medieval stronghold into a Victorian country house. In the late 19th century, the estate was purchased by a merchant simply for its timber, so he cut down all the trees. Um, uh, so um, today it's still in private ownership, and I think the outbuildings have been turned to into apartments. Again, when I was last there, that was uh, in process. I don't know whether it actually was completed. But the story of Cafagiolo demonstrates the usual trajectory of the Medici villas, from medieval defensive towers to humanist retreats to Renaissance palaces, uh, to Brock pleasure grounds. And um, having followed its history in detail, we'll now look briefly at other Medici villas, such as this one, which is Trebio. It's another humanist villa. It neighbors uh, uh, Cafagiolo. It's named Trebio for the three roads which meet nearby. It had been purchased in the 15th century by Cosimo the Elder uh, because he felt safer here. It was on, um, on a, the top of a slope where Cafagiolo was in the valley. So at the top of the slope, he could see his enemies coming. Um, as at Cafagiolo, we see the sort of random fenestrations, um, the asymmetrical layout uh, suggest centuries of casual expansion. The tower and the battlements um, provided protection at a time when the Medici were still provoking the ire of the mob with their domination of the increasingly nominal republic. But what's most interesting here is the kitchen garden, the walled garden. Uh, we see the beginnings of formality creeping in here. Um, you can just about see this dipping well, or perhaps it was a fish pond, but it has been uh, incorporated into the geometric pattern of the kitchen garden. Um, and the pattern itself is determined by geometry rather than geography. Although the garden is on a slope, 
um, it was still, a, a, you know, this eight point pattern was still forced on the, on the space. And similarly, there are pergolas flanking the garden at the top and the bottom of the slope. And while these were utilitarian climbing frames for vines, they also acted as a, to create a pleasant arbor for um, peripatetic study or for conversation. And the surrounding buildings here would have housed the tenants, the agent, the bakery, the forge, the storage. Uh, but another interesting feature is this um, rather prominently placed chapel, um, which attests to Cosimo's piety or perhaps his wish to um, expiate the sin of usury, which he practiced so successfully. Well, there it is today. You can see it's virtually unchanged. Uh, the pattern um, cut into the, uh, into the slope is still there. The bottom pergola has gone, but the top pergola remains. Well, through the 14th century, a succession of plagues had decimated the peasant population, uh, giving more bargaining powers to those who survived. So instead of living under feudal lords uh, who, to whom they owed utter obedience, many of them preferred to operate as independent farmers in what was called the mesedria or half and half system, where the harvest would be split uh, equally. The farmers would provide the labor and the landowner would supply housing and stables and storage and equipment and seed and livestock and any other capital expenses, including on occasion dowries for the um, farmer's daughters. And while the literature of the time is full of diatribes against wily peasants and naive landlords and unscrupulous agents, the system must have worked reasonably well because it, it lasted well into the Second World War. Another humanist villa is Karegi, which is a farm that was purchased by Cosimo's father um, as part of his program of rural expansion. It's just four kilometers uh, northwest of Florence. And this was Cosimo the Elder's preferred villa because he could trim his vines in the morning and then descend to the city on his mule um, to attend affairs of state uh, in the afternoons. So he was very careful always to ride a mule. If uh, any of you who noticed the first image um, uh, Gottsley's procession of the Magi, you see him very centrally placed, but he's on his mule because um, he was careful never to provoke the jealousy of his fellow Florentines. So he dressed modestly, he behaved uh, discreetly, um, he acted with humility, he, he um, lived a very humble life. But interestingly, they kept the original name of this villa, which was Campus Regi, which means field of kings. And what that is doing is evoking the earlier Etruscan kings who lived in this area. Um, the Etruscans were thought to be the most civilized of the pre-Roman tribes uh, on the Indian peninsula, uh, on the Italian peninsula. Um, and the Medici were always aligning themselves to those Etruscans. In a way, they were trying to suggest that they were bringing back the pre-Roman glory um, to the region. And um, in, uh, in Zocchi's 18th century print, again, you can see it's still very much a sort of farm even though it is a villa, it's very much a kind of uh, a, a pastoral scene. Um, and this would have been the original farmhouse. Uh, the lodger and the extension were later additions, as were the uh, roofing of the, of the battlements. But you can still see the, uh, the original rural farm um, very evident in the villa as it is today. Um, for Cosimo, farming was not a posture. He really did enjoy farming. Like the philosophers of the classical world, Cosimo saw working the land as a kind of noble and virtuous activity, especially when it was combined with scholarship and contemplation. In 1462, troubled with intimations of mortality, he wrote to his friend, the philosopher, Marsilio Ficino, saying, yesterday I came to Careggi to cultivate not my fields, but my soul. And then he begs Ficino to come and visit and to bring with him his new translation of Plato. Uh, indeed, it's said that Plato was being read to Cosimo as he died in the villa. Well, in 1450, Cosimo's son Giovanni created the first purpose-built humanist villa. It was not a renovation of an existing farmhouse or an existing tower. Um, it was built from scratch. It was built very much at the edge of a slope, as you can see here, uh, a steep slope. Um, because the land was so steep, there was obviously no commercial value to it. Uh, so this was a villa that was built simply for pleasure. And it's known as the Villa Medici uh, Fiesoli. Now, Fiesoli is another of those early Etruscan settlements. And the fact that they kept the name Fiesoli in the name of the villa, again, is a, a way of linking themselves to the, um, the Etruscans. Well, this was even more conveniently placed. It was only two miles north of the city. So it was easily accessible for afternoons or weekends. So it could be smaller than the earlier villas because, um, because Giovanni wouldn't need to bring his whole entourage out if he wanted to go and uh, and hang out in the villa for an afternoon. 
Um, but the layout was absolutely revolutionary. It was a cube shape. It shows the sort of humanist interest in geometry. Uh, also, there was no central courtyard. There were lodges on both the east and the west sides, which drew nature right into, literally into the body of the villa. Um, so it really was about celebrating nature. It was also a great engineering feat. Uh, Michelozzo had dug right into the rock to create the cellars and storerooms and stables, which were all the accoutrements of a gentleman. Indeed, later Vasari described this villa as a splendid and noble palace. So what we see here is the beginnings of the shift from the villas being humanist retreats to being Renaissance palaces. Um, and the villa also contained such novelties as libraries and music rooms. Again, showing that this is very much a place of leisure rather than labor. Um, the Villa Medici became a kind of emblem of the humanist movement. And so it occurs in many paintings of the time as um, in um, Biagio's Annunciation. Uh, and people who even weren't uh, members of the Medici family would include the Villa in their pictures, partly to display their allegiance to the Medici, but also to display their sort of humanist um, credentials. And there we see it in the back of um, Galandio's Assumption of the Virgin. Um, well, in the late 15th century, Cosmo's grandson, Lorenzo, Lorenzo the Magnificent, inherited the villa. Um, and since he had other villas to deal with, he often left it to his friends to, um, to come and stay in the villa. And one of those friends was Poliziano, the aforementioned tutor to the children and philosopher. And in one of the letters in the archives, Poliziano writes to his friend Ficino, uh, begging him to join him at the villa. He says, the villa lies off the road in a dense wood, but commands a view of the whole city. And through the district, and though the district is thick, thickly populated, I enjoy the solitude dear to those who have fled from town. Well, what's interesting about this is the way he says it was thickly populated. Before Giovanni built his villa there, no self-respecting uh, Florentine would have built on that steep slope. But because Giovanni and the Medici were so important, suddenly everybody wanted to build on that slope. Um, so it was densely populated, but also it shows the humanist desire for solitude. Um, he says he, it enjoys, he enjoys the solitude dear to those who have fled from town. But also it's all about the view. You can see here how it's very much on the edge of the slope. And yet it takes in a view of, um, well, you saw it in the other one, of the, the river flowing out to the port cities of Pisa and of Florence in the distance. There it is today. You can see it's virtually unchanged um, over the past 500 years. Uh, this has now become the entrance. It would in the past, this area would have been the, um, the, the garden. And then there's a lower level, small uh, terrace, which would have been the kitchen garden. This lower level would only, was only accessible through the basement of the villa or through a rough sort of farm track around the back here. And any of you who've been there um, and visited the villa will realize that's still the only way to get to the lower terrace. In fact, um, in the 20th century, a third terrace was built there. But had the villa been built 50 years later, during the high Renaissance period, this, uh, this slope would have been scaled by some sort of grand staircase or grand um, ramp. But as it is, it's just a, a sort of simple farm track. Well, um, here we're moving into the high Renaissance with Lorenzo the Magnificent. As this anonymous portrait indicates, he was anything but magnificent. He was short, he was plump, he had a flat nose, a harsh voice, but none of this seemed to have diminished his confidence or indeed his charm. By the time Lorenzo um, led the family, the banks had diminished partly through mismanagement, partly through costly, costly wars and political expenses. But to retain power, Lorenzo had to provide pageants and games for the public, and he had to provide bribes and gifts and extravagant entertainments for the officials. So he was always looking for new sources of entertainment, uh, of, um, of income. And one of the things he did was to turn to farming. Um, he also wanted to establish his family's presence to the west of the province. It was part of a kind of new expansionist policy where Cosimo, his grandfather, had been interested mainly in banking, in making money through banking. Uh, Lorenzo was uh, much more interested in expanding his, uh, his realm. So he created Poggio Acaiano, um, which was supposed to be a model farm uh, to the west of Florence. Poggio means hill and Caiano, well, Cai was probably a, a Roman patronym. So again, the family is trying to link themselves to a noble past. Um, this is clearly no small suburban retreat for scholarship. It's a 
a grand villa for um, built for politics as well as pleasure. Notice how the villa is very much separate from the farm. The farm itself was a grand farm. Um, there is storage and uh, accommodation here, and then uh, the courtyard in front of the farm is um, is uh, walled in, and then you've got the neat ordered fields around the farm. Um, but the villa is definitely separate, both from the farm and from the guard post. So whatever pleasures were going on here were uh, distinctly private pleasures. Uh, it was strategically placed where the Ombroni River meets the Arno. So thus it's connecting the important inland towns of Prato and Pistoia with the seaports of Pisa. Um, so it was a model farm. Uh, here he bred exotic rabbits and guinea fowl and Arabian racehorses. So one of the things he's doing is trying to separate himself from modest stock farmers. He's uh, aligning himself in these precious project products with sultans and monarchs rather than mere farmers. Um, his breeding program was not notably successful. Equally unsuccessfully, he planted mulberry trees in an attempt to uh, beef up a silk industry in Florence. He also experimented with rice, uh, which was a novel cereal. It had been introduced by the Moors um, and it was not yet a staple of the Northern Italian diet. What he did was canalize the river behind the villa, he built dikes and embankments and cut canals into the surrounding marshland to drain the, uh, the land. Well, as Zocchi's 18th century print indicates, he wasn't very good at stopping the erosion. Um, in fact, Lorenzo was a talented poet and one of his most famous poems was called Ambra. Ambra was actually the estate's previous name before the Medici uh, renamed it Poggio Alcayano. Um, and in this poem, the river god Ambroni attempts to rape the nymph Ambra and she's transformed into an island who's guarded by the faithful shepherd Lauro, i.e. Lorenzo. So it's um, Lorenzo's wry account of himself attempting to protect his estate from flooding, not very successfully. But Zocchi's print shows us a neat ordered fields and the, um, the grand entrance pavilions, uh, a large stable, although this stable is actually a later addition. Um, and clearly this, is, uh, this farm is promoting leisure and pleasure as much as it is promoting farming. And Lorenzo managed to do this because he cornered the market in alum, uh, which is a mineral salt, which is essential for tanning and dyeing and glass making. Um, he managed to negotiate the sole rights to new deposits which were discovered in the papal states. But he, more important even than that was he persuaded the Pope to excommunicate anyone who bought alum from the infidel Turks, um, who'd previously controlled the alum supplies from their mines in modern day Izmir. So that ensured the family's wealth for several generations to come. Um, this is a mid 16th century image of um, Eleanor of Toledo's entourage as she comes to um, Tuscany to marry um, Cosimo I. Um, but it shows that these rural villas were used as resting places for the Medici brides when they're coming from abroad. Like precious plants, they had to be acclimatized before they actually got transplanted to their new homes in Florence. Um, but it shows us that the uh, the villa is built on this kind of lower floor, like a cryptoporticus of, of, um, of Roman palaces. Um, rather than integrating into the slope as the Villa Medici had done, this is definitely rising above the slope. Uh, it also is the first to use this classical temple motif uh, in the modern world. Um, some might say that Lorenzo was um, displaying a bit of hubris in this. Um, the Medici family at this point in the late 15th century was powerful enough that they no longer had to pretend to be of the people. Um, and he certainly wasn't um, the modest the way his grandfather had been. Um, so this villa marks the shift from the early humanist idea of integrating with nature to a new Renaissance idea of rising above and observing nature. And we see also in the Renaissance, um, nature becoming a subject in its own right in the poetry and the art of the time. Uh, and having the living area raised up on a sort of plinth-like space makes the villa itself almost into a work of art, into something to be venerated uh, in its own right. Well, like the Villa Medici, uh, it had, um, Puerto Vicano had no uh, internal courtyard. Um, it was symmetrical on all four facades. It was covered in smooth white plaster, which made it dominate the landscape. It was visible for miles around. The interiors laid out round a grand salon and the main rooms were designed so that you could look through them, through the windows and doors to actually see the landscape uh, beyond. Well, in 1492, aged 43, Lorenzo died before the villa was actually completed. 
His eldest son, Piero, known as Piero the Unfortunate, got the family banished after negotiating a bad deal with King Charles VIII of France, who was invading Tuscany on his way south. Uh, in um, 1515, Lorenzo's second son, Cardinal Giovanni, was elected Pope Leo X, and he used the villa as his summer residence. Well, partly every pope has to have a summer residence, but he chose this villa as a summer residence to re-establish the family's presence in um, Tuscany. So again, we see these villas, these Renaissance villas, as being used very much for political ends. Um, Leo X was more devoted to Diana, the um, goddess of the hunt, than he was to Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. And even when he became much too fat to ride, he used to love watching the hunt from afar. And um, so Poggio became the center of, a, of um, great hunts. But it was he who actually completed the villa and he created the grand central uh, salon, which later became known as the Hall of Leo X. Um, he had it decorated by the best artists of the, uh, of the time. And the most interesting image probably is this picture by Pontormo of Vertimus and Pomona. Uh, it's a story from Ovid's Metamorphosis, which was a collection of myths, transformation myths um, in the classical world. And uh, this myth tells the story of the haughty nymph Pomona, uh, there she is, um, who, uh, who spurns the satyr Vertimus. There's the satyr Vertimus. He disguises himself as an old man. He enters her walled garden and he convinces her to carpe diem, to seize the day. And she says, oh yes, maybe I made a mistake. You can see her beginning to change her mind. Um, and then suddenly he reveals himself as the beautiful youth. Uh, and um, consummation is implied by his nakedness as he clutches the branch, which basically leads back to her um, in her very red dress with her leg enticingly revealed. While this theme of fertility is appropriate enough for a rural villa, the erotic depiction of seduction and surrender is an unusual choice for a papal villa. Um, possibly, I haven't read this anywhere, and I'm not a great art historian, but possibly it's an allegory, I think, of the population resisting and then succumbing to Medici rule and then um, and the fecundity that, that was a result of that uh, succumbing. Well, the villa was fairly, further embellished by Leo's cousin, Pope Clement, whose illegitimate, possibly illegitimate son, Alessandro the Moor, was raised in the villa to keep him far enough from the flesh pots of Florence to which he was drawn, but also close enough to Florence to train him for a life of diplomacy because he was being groomed to take over. Having apprenticed in the court of Charles V, Vasari claims that Alessandro entertained the emperor at the villa and the emperor remarked, these walls were not meant for a private citizen and promptly made Alessandro the Duke of the Republic of Florence. Well, clearly more um, negotiation was involved than that. But, um, but what's most perplexing about this story is the idea of uh, the title, since a republic doesn't need a duke, um, it doesn't have a ruler. Anyway, uh, he also gave Alessandro his illegitimate daughter to marry, thus aligning the Medici with the powerful Habsburg dynasty and securing their place among the ruling families of Europe. But as his bride was still a child when they married, she was 13 years to his 26, Alessandro continued his wicked ways and was assassinated several years later in a sting at the house of a pious widow he was attempting to seduce. Well, there we see the villa today. Um, the circular staircase uh, and the um, uh, crowning clock were early 19th century embellishments put there by Napoleon's sister, Eliza Bonaparte who used Poggio as her summer residence during her brief reign as the Grand Duchess of Tuscany. Um, she intended to create a, a sort of English style natural garden, um, but never actually got around to it before she was deposed, um, or in fact, before he was deposed. Um, but she still entertained many of her lovers here, including Paganini, who apparently conducted many concerts in the grounds. Um, meanwhile, back in the 16th century, Alessandro's, after Alessandro's assassination, his 17 year old cousin, also named Cosimo after uh, the um, Cosimo the Elder, um, rode into Florence and grabbed the ducal title. Well, as Bronzino's portrait indicates, he meant business. Uh, he later supported Charles V, the emperor, who in exchange elevated him to Grand Duke of Tuscany. To consolidate his position, um, Cosimo created several villas to the West, uh, continuing Lorenzo's expansionist policy. Well, nominally these were hunting villas, but they were really designed to establish the Medici control over that rest of territory. Um, the most notorious uh, of these villas is Ceruto Guidi, 
which was designed by his favorite architect, uh, Bernardo Buontalenti, who was primarily a military engineer. And certainly this looks more like a fortress than a, than a villa. And this grand ramp was created uh, so that horses could uh, walk up it right up to the um, front entrance. And the villa achieved its notoriety largely because this is the villa where Isabella de' Medici was, um, was murdered by her husband, Cosimo's daughter, Isabella. But in a more princely man manner, um, Cosimo transformed the small farm and orchard where he was brought up into uh, a royal palace and garden befitting his new status. Um, see here the jousting in front, which shows that even Cosimo had to provide bread and circuses to keep uh, his population amused. Here again, we see the shift from the humanist ideal of the rural villa as a commercial retreat and a celebration of nature to the high Renaissance idea of the villa and garden as an architectural space that's ordered and symmetrical. And it's designed more for political and diplomatic purposes than for scholarship or commerce. Um, the garden in particular becomes an intellectual sphere with the introduction of complex symbolism. A master of propaganda, Cosmo commissioned an historian to devise an allegorical program for the garden, which um, glorifies the family, presents the garden itself as a microcosm of Tuscany, and links uh, Cosimo in Castello, which is the name of the villa, to the Etruscan past and, uh, and that past greatness. In fact, here again, Cosimo restored the earlier Roman name of Castello, which means cistern, to remind visitors of his feat in harnessing the waters of the Apennine streams to bring fresh water into the city of Florence. Um, look at how it is carefully uh, aligned. The villa and garden are aligned as one. We will see that there's a little bit of deceit involved in this image. Um, well, the symbolic program is carried by the water in the garden. Uh, it follows the slope of the land from the dense primitive area at the top, um, which was a woodland, it represents nature untamed. In the Renaissance, this was, I, there was this idea of the three natures. The first nature is, rena, is uh, um, nature untamed. The second nature is, um, we see on this second terrace, which is man exploiting nature for commercial ends. And this is the lemon garden. Uh, lemon trees were, had recently been uh, introduced from North Africa. Um, and um, they were still considered very exotic. And the fact that the Medici had hundreds of lemon trees was a testament to their wealth. Uh, and then the water flows through this grotto of the animals to the lowest terrace, the lowest terrace, which is um, the pleasure garden, which represents man and nature working together to create a work of art. Uh, well, the most famous feature of the garden is probably the grotto of the animals. We see it now, even when you go and visit it today and it's been restored, it still seems a rather dry, uninspired space. But imagine at the time there would be water dripping from the tufa ceiling, spurting up from the ground and spewing from the mouths of each of the animals. And each of the animals had symbolic significance. So we have the lion in the middle, which represents the city of Florence. Uh, we have the goat in this kind of fraternal relationship with the lion. The goat is uh, Capricorn, which is the emblem of um, Cosimo himself. So it's showing him in this kind of uh, fraternal relationship. The lion is, is literally uh, dependent on the ram, which was Francesco, uh, Cosimo's heir, son and heir. Um, it was the zodiac sign of Francesco. Um, the bull, uh, what do we have here? The, the elephant is, um, represents Hanno, which was a gift to uh, Leo, Pope Leo from the Portuguese king. Um, there's a, uh, boar at the back, which was um, uh, um, antique sculpture owned by Clement. So what, um, what Cosimo is doing here is showing his very powerful ancestors. And then in the center above the lion, you have the unicorn, which again is a reference to uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis, where he tells of a unicorn coming upon a fetid stream and sticking its horn in, and it purifies the stream. And again, it's a, a reminder to visitors of Cosimo's great feat in bringing pure water into Florence. Uh, the statuary as well um, is full of, uh, of sophisticated imagery. It goes from the Apennino at the top to the Venus at the bottom. Um, this is a primitive image. It's a man sweating or weeping or squeezing the water from himself at the top of the uh, garden. And at the bottom, you have the Venus figure just wringing the water from her hair and it's flowing abundantly. Um, 
in the protean way of symbolism, uh, each of these sculptures carries multiple uh, symbolic significances. So um, in a theory of the, uh, of the seasons, this is winter, Iverno, and this is spring. Um, in a season of the gods, this is Apennino. Uh, no, this is Janus, which is the um, god of boundaries. And, and uh, he features at the top, the uppermost periphery of the garden. Um, and uh, the Venus figure represents the city. It was also known as Florence. So we're going from the primitive mountains to the sophisticated city. Uh, in the allegory of the gods, um, of the, what else have I done? Seasons, gods, um, elements um, from the city to the mountains, from the mountains to the city. Um, but right close to the villa, the most um, dramatic of the uh, sculptures is Hercules and, and, um, and Antaeus. Antaeus was the son of Tellus, the earth goddess. And as long as his feet were on the ground, he was invincible, but he was a giant and he was, uh, he was besieging the area. So Hercules went and lifted him off the ground and squeezed the life from him. And a jet, a huge jet would, would rise up from his mouth. Uh, representing blood and the spirit, but also um, providing water. So in the allegories, it represents cosmos taming of a primitive force, taming of the mountains to provide water. It represents the triumph of man over nature, of civilization over savagery, of virtue over vice, and more precisely of Cosimo over his Republican enemies. Well, by the 18th century, tastes had changed. Again, in this, um, this print by Zocchi. We see the Medici had died out, the Habsburgs had inherited the, uh, the villas and they embraced a much more open English landscape style, um, favoring naturalism over formality. So they, they removed the walls, they transformed the terraces back into slopes, uh, they grassed the fish ponds in front to create a vast open lawn and they removed much of the statuary. Well, there it is today. And as you see, uh, Newton's print, um, it's not quite honest because the garden is not actually centered on the villa. It's not sure whether Cosimo originally intended to expand the villa so the garden would have been centered on the garden, uh, on the villa, or perhaps in 1530 when the garden was begun, the idea of integrating the architecture with the horticulture wasn't deemed that important. Uh, but anyway, if you go there today, you'll see um, that uh, the garden does not actually align itself on the, on the villa. But also this shows us the um, form of conventional villas, which is the, the traditional villas around uh, a central courtyard to provide light to the rooms. Um, and the Villa Medici and Poggio Cayano were so revolutionary because they didn't have this central courtyard. They were just one, um, had a central salon. Well, this brings us to um, the uh, final generation of Medici villa makers and the Baroque villas of the late 16th century, which were built not for commerce or scholarship or even for diplomacy, but for pleasure. As demonstrated by Cosimo's daughter, Isabella, who created the least known, but perhaps the most intriguing of the Medici villas. Unlike most women of her time, Isabella had been educated along with the boys at court. Like her mother, she was a great gambler. She was also a great huntress and she rode with the men rather than watching with the women, which was very unusual. Uh, nonetheless, she too had been married off uh, for dynastic reasons to a venal and profligate Roman playboy called Paolo Orsini, whose properties abutted the uh, southern border of Tuscany. So Cosimo was anxious to secure that border. Um, because he adored her, she was allowed to remain with her dowry at his court. With her dowry is significant. She had a great dowry and he didn't want uh, Paolo Orsini to, um, to deplete it. And also after her mother's death, she acted virtually as her father's consort, which is another reason why she was allowed to stay on. Um, when Cosimo confiscated the properties of a treacherous cousin, Alessandro Salviati, he charged his oldest son, Francesco, with the um, disposing of the traitor's effects, one of which was a modest villa just beyond the city's southern gate called Poggio Baroncelli, named after an earlier owner. When Isabella begged her brother for the villa, he refused. He couldn't bear the idea of her getting her own villa out of the city. Um, she turned to her father and he immediately gave it to her. Um, propriety was satisfied because the villa virtually abutted the Bobbley Garden. So it was like an extension of the family uh, house in the, the Pitti Palace, yet it was far enough away for her to create her own court. Here, unconstrained by spousal authority and indulged by a uh, generous father, she enlarged the villa and branded it with a Medici crest. 
Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find, I don't think there exists an image of the villa as it was in her time. These, uh, this crowning um, uh, story and these extensions were uh, later editions. Um, this is probably the villa as she knew it. Um, what is known is that she commissioned two life-size erotic sculptures for the garden. One is a Bacchus, which is appropriate enough, I suppose, for a villa uh, surrounded by vineyards. But this Bacchus uh, is accompanied by a satyr, which is an image of um, sexual license, uh, sexual excess, in fact. And the other is an Adonis who is writhing in agony, possibly in agony, uh, possibly having been gored by a bull. Um, at this time, few women commissioned art at all. And when they did, it was generally of a religious nature. So her garden statuary was to say the least uh, daring. Well, there it is today. Uh, Isabella always referred to it as La Mia Villa to indicate that she was not under either paternal or spousal control. And at La Sua Villa, she created a court of high culture and low characters peopled by lively young women and adoring young men. She commissioned poetry, she sponsored artists, she entertained writers, musicians, and intellectuals. Ambassadors were soon recording happy evenings lost to dice and cards at the villa while their wives resentfully attributed her independence and her many miscarriages to her hedonistic lifestyle. But among her dalliances, she had the misfortune to fall in love with her husband's cousin, whom he'd charged with protecting her while he carried on with his mistresses in Rome. While under Cosmo's liberal reign, such dalliances were tolerated as long as they were discreet. Um, when he died, Isabella lost his protection and she fell under the rule of her vindictive husband. Like her cousin before her, she was lured to a hunting party, this time at the distant villa of Treccio Guidi, where she too was um, strangled by her husband. This murder too was tacitly accepted by her brother, the new Grand Duke Ferdinando uh, Francesco. Um, they were accepted as sort of honor killings because while noble men were allowed to sow their wild oats, noble women uh, must remain faithful to protect the all important bloodlines which leads us to the Francesco. Um, he was secretive, paranoid. Uh, he created an atmosphere of fear, which lasted the 13 years of his reign. And despite being the first member of the family to marry legitimately into the European royal, royalty, uh, he neglected his wife, Joanna of Austria, um, because she couldn't provide a son, although she provided daughter after daughter. He became obsessed with his mistress for whom he created the Villa of Pratolino. Um, he married her at the villa even before it was completed, her husband having conveniently been killed in a street brawl a few years earlier. Uh, the marriage took place a mere two months after his wife had uh, conveniently fallen down the stairs to her death while pregnant with her eighth child. Well, visitors to the villa, Pratolino, would come upon this. This was the first thing they'd see. It's a, it's a gigantic gargantuan sculpture, also known as Apennino. So it's a reference to the Apennino in his father's garden, but it's much more dramatic, much more Baroque, uh, much ru more rustic. And in fact, it was so big that the head was a chamber and the eyes were windows in the, uh, in the chamber. Uh, the garden was also known as um, the Villa of Marbles. Uh, it was created on a wooden site, a steep wooden site, and it exemplifies the brief Mannerist period um, it was a time when people were fascinated by mystery and deception and surprise. It's a sort of surreal, disorienting place. Uh, as you can see, there was a central uh, avenue along which two men could ride on horseback side by side and still not be hit by the jets of water which, which uh, flew over it. But beyond that, everything was chaos. Uh, if you were walking down the slope, you couldn't see what was ahead of you. Uh, there's no particular order. The place was full of... Um, jockey and, uh, and um, sculptures that moved and um, little uh, outbuildings. Um, where Castello's animals appeared to be alive because the water flowing over them, here in, uh, in Pratolina, the animals actually moved because of the hydrology. So um, though Prato was conceived, Pratolina was conceived partly as an earthly paradise and a playground. It was also designed to display uh, Francesco's command of hydrology and engineering, its exotic plants displayed his bounty, its classical references attested to his scholarship, while its political illusions asserted his right to rule. A contemporary poet, Francesco Vieri, wrote a sycophantic poem comparing the management of the garden to the management of the state, implying that the patron who can control nature so effectively can also control the citizenry. Uh, 
Well, in 1609, Francesco died very suddenly and his wife, uh, Bianca, followed very soonly, very quickly. Um, and his brother, Cardinal Ferdinando, happily abandoned his Cardinal's hat to assume the role of Grand Duke. Um, addressing the obligation to provide an heir, he married uh, a distant, much younger cousin, Christine of Lorraine, to whom he bequeathed Petraia, which was a small domestic villa, uh, which had been purchased by Cosmo to provide water for a castello nearby, next door. Um, it was named Petraia because of the rocky ground on which it stood, uh, it too was never really developed. It always remained um, a small domestic retreat. And because the water had been siphoned off to feed the fountains of Castello, there were no grand gardens. Uh, it's divided into three terraces. The top terrace was uh, leveled to create a lawn with these little dwarf trees that the Medici family loved. Um, the middle slope contained the reservoir, which, uh, which supported the garden and also provided the fish for the Friday suppers. And it's surrounded by gardens of simples, which were herbs or exotic plants. And then the lower slope, which here appears to have been terraced to be flat. Uh, in in um, using Selenet, it suggests that it had these wonderful round arbors. In fact, the arbors were never built and the slope was never terraced, uh, which shows you that like many artists, Eutens was flattering his um, patrons. Uh, Perhaps because it was so um, modest, it became a family favorite and it stayed in the family throughout um, their reign. Um, and with the unification of Italy in the 1860s, it became the favorite of King Victor Emmanuel and his Morganat Morganatic uh, second wife, who glazed over the uh, central courtyard to create a grand salon for the, wife, for the wedding of their son. Uh, today, it is still owned by the state and it houses the Utens and Nets. Um, meanwhile, Ferdinand, Ferdinando himself was an avid hunter and he would move from one villa to the next through the seasons. These peregrinations were important in reinforcing the family's presence. And by the late 16th century, the Medici villas could be joined in a chain around the province, basically justifying the family's claim to absolute rule of Tuscany. In um, 1583, he uh, purchased La Maya, which was a fortified tower around which he had a villa built. He put in a lake for fishing and that nesting box suggests there was fowling. And here we see hunting. Um, but these hay ricks and the ordered orchards suggest it was also a, a, a productive farm. He also purchased an old fishing lodge uh, on the banks of the Arno named after the Ambrogi family. This was Ambrogiana. Um, and he expanded the villa and created a grand garden so that the Medici's wealth could be seen by everybody passing on the river. And finally, as if these weren't enough, one day when he was out hunting on a hilltop, he found the view so enchanting that he asked, uh, in fact, he commanded Buontalenti to build him a hunting villa on the spot. This was called Ar Artemino from uh, Artemium, which was an ancient temple of Artemis nearby. And it's for Artemino that the 17 Newton's Lynettes were commissioned to go over the window and doors of the central uh, salon. This was the last of the Medici Tuscan villas. Uh, subsequent generations either expanded and embellished or neglected and sold off the villas, depending on fashion and the family's fortunes. Um, in the mid 18th century, the Medici line died out. The duchy was inherited by a distant relative, but the final and childless Grand Duchess, Anna Maria uh, Luisa, bequeathed all the villas and their arts and artifacts to the Tuscan state with the proviso that none of them be removed from the duchy. Well, the turbulent two centuries followed as the Italian peninsula was unified by Napoleon, then fractured by the victorious allies, and then reunified after the 50 year struggle for independence from the various uh, Austrian, French and Vatican rulers. Um, in 1861, the United Kingdom of Italy emerged, but it was virtually bankrupt. Um, so the Medici villas were rediscovered, but there was no money for restoration or maintenance. Some were sold, some were restored, and most were abandoned to benign neglect. Happily, uh, in the late 20th century, as uh, Italy gained in affluence and education, there was a renewed interest in the villas, and today they're recognized as a valuable part of the country's cultural, architectural, and horticultural heritage. So uh, there we have the Medici villas. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. So we'll share the screen. There we go. And there's the, the Zoom is coming up. Very good. Okay, so I'll get some light in so we can see what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, as always, 
I'll just get on the camera for a minute. Um, there we are. Um, yeah, so anyone in the room who would like to make a comment or ask a question, please put your hand up and I'll bring the microphone. And those on the Zoom, if you want to uh, join in, you can either just unmute yourself and talk to us, or you can put something up in the comments and then we can see what's going on. I'll just put the chat up here so I can see it. There we are. Okay, so we have one over here. Hi, Katie. Thanks very much indeed. Just wondered how many of them are open to the public now? Um, all the ones that I talked about are open to the public. Um, in about maybe seven years ago, the UNESCO uh, designated 12 of the villas as sites of strategic importance. And so they are all, 12 of them are open. So if you look on the UNESCO site, you can see which ones are open. Petraia, the my penultimate or antepenultimate one I showed you, often when you go there, it's actually closed, which is rather frustrating. Um, and often when you go to Castello near, nearby, it's closed. But the person who um, sits in the gatehouse at Petraia usually has the keys for Castello. So that's a, a tip if you go and find Castello is closed. And, and if you were to only go to one or two, which ones would you recommend best visitor experience? Um, if, you're, if you're interested in the symbolism, I think Castello is quite interesting. Um, not much of it exists, but if you go with the image, with the Uton's image, it is quite fun to trace it both to trace the, the symbolic significance through the garden, but also to see the changes over time from the sort of formal Renaissance garden to the informal 18th century um, sort of naturalization of the garden. Um, that would be the one I go to first. Just so though. Yeah. Okay, it's good, good advice. We have a question from John. Thanks, Simon. And Katie, thank you so much. Two questions, Pratolinu, um, Bernardo Montalente, yes, for the uh, hydraulics. Yeah. Uh, you have up there, sorry. Mostly, yes. Yes. Um, Diane Archibald, is, her name is there, the architectural historian, uh, also uh, involved with ECOMOS. Um, was she, her work was referenced during the, the lecture, yes? Uh, no, no, I met her, uh, but only recently, and I, um, I wasn't aware of her work, no. Very good, I can recommend. <laughs> right, that's where that work. Very good. M maybe Diane wants to make a contribution. Feel free to join in if you want. Um, okay, so yes, we've got another one in the room. Uh, hello, and thank you for the wonderful lecture. My name is Raffaele Nicoli Vallesi. I work in Villa La Quiete, which is not far from Castello and Petraia, and it's another Medici villa. You mentioned Anna Maria Luisa before, the, the last of the Medici. Yeah. And so the, this is another interesting garden for all of you to, to see. Uh, which is, uh, was done later in 18th century, uh, end of the Medici dynasty. But maybe, have you, have you ever been there? The, yeah, what, what is the name of the garden? Villa La Quiete. La Quiete, La Quiete no, no, no. Yeah. And it's not one of the ones, unfortunately, that, yeah. um, that uh, UNESCO has, has listed. Yeah, it's not yet in the UNESCO list, but... Uh, is it open to the public? Yes. It's, it's, oh, right. it's uh, of the University of Florence. Right. And uh, yes, it's, uh, it's very important because it's the last of the Medici and it takes uh, lots of things you, you've mentioned uh, from Castello and uh, you know, uh, Petraia, but uh, it's all uh, were, were designed by the Anna Maria Luisa, the last of the Medici. So. Did she come, did she live there after her husband yes. died and she came back to Florence? I thought yes. that she lived out her life in the Pitti Palace. Yes, but also uh, during summer, she, she went to the, this villa uh, and that also was the house of a female college named Le Montalve. And so it's a whole uh, female story, very interesting. Uh, and uh, so if you want to- Yes, I will definitely go and see it. That sounds yeah, like thank you. interesting. Thank you very much. It's one of the nice features of these lectures is we often have people in the audience who know a lot about the subject. <laughs> so we have a, a intellectual yeah. and cultural exchange. Okay, is anyone on the- um, There's someone at the back. Zoom. Got I just want to give a Zoom as a chance. Does anyone want to say anything on the Zoom? Uh, or put something. Oh yes, the name of the last villa. Yeah. La Quieta. La, La Quieta, Brenda. Okay, so we got uh, somebody at the back here, right at the very back, lurking in the darkness. Thank you for this superb historical uh, lecture. I'm curious. These villas must have required a lot of maintenance, and where did the people live that supported them, that maintained them, that 
there are there are buildings um farm farm buildings on within the estates um where they would have lived probably and and there are little villages beside which would have probably been originally part of the uh the estates uh, in fact one of the things that i didn't mention is that um the medici were very gen they might have been vicious to their enemies but they were ge very generous to their friends um Ficino, the philosopher was given an, a, a little farm on the um i think it was the Correggi estate because um, Cosimo wanted to make sure he was around when he wanted to talk philosophy. And uh, Donatello, again, um, which was it? One of the estates, I think it was probably Carreg uh, Cafagiolo. Um, Donatello uh, was a favorite Medici sculptor. Um, many of you will have seen the exhibition, the absolutely spectacular exhibition uh, at the Strozzi Palace, but um, he was always short of money. So Cosimo um, told his sons to make sure he would always have money by giving him an, a, a farm on the estate with tenant farmers. And after about two years, Don, Donatello originally was delighted to have, you know, to be a landowner. Um, and after about two years, he came back to them and said he couldn't bear the constant uh, complaints of his tenant farmers and he wanted them to take back the farm. So what in fact they did was they managed the farm and gave him the income. Um, and so he had a very happy and comfortable old age. Very good. Um, before, yeah. But before we go um, on with the questions, I'm just going to do my weekly reminder to the Zoomers that um, uh, you're welcome to join on the Zoom without any uh, fee or payment. But uh, if you could make a contribution or whatever you felt comfortable with, that will help the Institute keep going. We are a non-profit. We do not have any public funding, despite our name. Um, so, so we. Uh, sorry, that was uh, I was I was not audible. I was asking for the, for the for the donations from the Zoomers, reminding you that we need. Um, contributions keep going because we have no funding from the British government or anybody else. Um, so, um, and of course, this, this month, 20% is going to the uh, Ukraine appeal from the Kvachiros. So that's another reason for the incentive. So have we got a question here? Yes. Brenda, uh, do you have any information on the Medici fishery near Serevetsa in Liguria? Well, the river was so clear that the Medici did put a fishery there. Um, but, and they tried to revive the, the mines in that area as well, uh, but it never really worked. And then in the 19th century, no, the 18th century, they started to use the villa again as a family villa. So, um, so they didn't want the industry around it. They'd actually made a ferry that was attached to the villa to go to carry the iron ore, I suppose, um, down to the ports. Um, and if you go and visit the villa, you can still see where the ferry was attached to the villa. Uh, the fishery is no longer exists, but there's, um, sculpture workshops in the in the buildings of the old fishery. Uh, and um, it's a really interesting villa to visit. If you look at the Uton's lunette uh, of it, there's a long lawn between the, the barn and the villa itself uh, to show you that, again, the Medici were grand enough. They didn't want the farms nearby. They didn't want to have to smell the horses and the cows and things. Um, and it's a very primitive villa, but I think it was um, Christina uh, Ferdinando's wife uh, lived out her widowhood there because it was far away from the court. And uh, in the central courtyard, it's quite an austere space, but there's, um, there's a sculpture of a big fish because uh, she had caught once a very large fish in the river, and this was uh, a memory of that. Well, um, Diane Archibald's put something on the comments that she might read out. Uh, UNESCO designation of the 12 Medici villas and two gardens is a serial designation and due to private ownership of the many villas, it was a rare designation and that it has to be reviewed every few years for authenticity. Right. Well, good. Thank you. That's good to know. Authoritative view from UNESCO. Thank you, Diane. Um, okay. Any more in the room? Any more on the Zoom? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Anything else? Thank you from Brenda. Thank you from, I think it's probably queuing us all today. Thank you from everyone. So thank you very much indeed, Katie. It was a wonderful to have such an authoritative survey of the, the various Medici villas, Medici villas, which are you know, not so well known, actually. They, 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 I don't know where they get many visitors, but... Um, no, Sarah Vetsa, somebody was asking about. Um, I've been there several times and there's never been anyone else there. There's a yeah. small library. There's a sort of um, a museum of local life and it's really worth the effort. It's a, yeah. it's a charming space. So and I think that maybe it gives us all a, a project for the coming months if we haven't seen them to get out there and have a look. Very good. So thank you so much. And thank you very much to the Zoomers. See you all next week. Yeah. Bye bye Zoomers. Bye. Um, and for those in the room, it's now time for a glass of wine at the back of the room. So. Um,